Hi, it's Christopher Gofford. Dirty John is about love, deception, and one extremely dangerous man. If you liked our show, the young Charles Manson is the focus of season two of Hollywood and Crime. And I'm Tracy Patton, the host of the Wondery show Hollywood and Crime. As we saw in Dirty John, psychopaths don't come from nowhere. They're born. They have childhoods and teen years and really whole lives before they become the people we hear about. So... How did a troubled kid from West Virginia become Charles Manson? Join me and Stephen Lang from the hit films Avatar and Don't Breathe in Young Charlie as we journey into the mind of one of the most infamous psychopaths ever to stalk Hollywood. Let's start the journey right now with this special preview of Young Charlie. And don't forget to subscribe and listen to Young Charlie on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Or if you're listening on a smartphone, swipe or tap the cover art to find a link to take you there. Young Charlie from Hollywood and Crime contains depictions of violence and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. At a little after 8 a.m. on the morning of August 9, 1969, housekeeper Winifred Chapman approached the grounds of 10,050 Cielo Drive. As she got to the gate, she noticed a loose wire dangling above the control box. Already late, thanks to L.A.'s poor bus system, she was now concerned that the electricity might be out. But when she pressed the button, the gate swung open as it did every morning. Relieved, she entered the property. Only a few yards up from the gate, she noticed a white rambler at an oblique angle in the driveway. Several other vehicles were parked closer to the garage. Since overnight visitors were a common occurrence at the sprawling estate, she thought nothing of it. Entering the house through the service porch, Mrs. Chapman picked up the kitchen phone and noticed it was dead. Wondering if it could be due to the downed wire, she replaced the receiver. She headed for the living room, but was blocked by two large blue steamer trunks that hadn't been there when she'd left work the day before. They looked as if they'd been knocked over, one leaning against the other. Then she noticed the blood, smeared across the trunks, on the floor nearby on two towels lying in the living room entryway. For a moment she stood there, uncomprehending. Only now did she realize she hadn't heard a sound since entering the house. Forcing herself to move, she stepped toward the living room. Everywhere she looked, there was more blood. On the floor, the rugs, the furniture. The front door was half open, and two red pools spread across the porch. Beyond, she could see a body sprawled on the front lawn. Screaming, she ran from the house and down the driveway. This time, she noticed the body of a young man lying sideways across the front seat of the Rambler. She managed to get the gate open and fled to a neighboring house. Sharon Tate and four other persons were murdered. The scene described by one investigator is reminiscent of a weird religious rite. Five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband. In all my years, I have never seen anything like this before. As the sun rose higher on another sweltering day, Los Angeles residents would begin to learn about the events that had taken place hours earlier and struggle to find ways to understand them. In the early morning of August 9, 1969, five people had been savagely murdered in the tony reaches of the Hollywood Hills. They had been shot and stabbed and bludgeoned. Nooses had been hung round their necks. The owner of the house had pled for the life of her unborn child as she was stabbed repeatedly in the chest. This would not be a night for mercy. What the victims would never know was that the author of their gruesome deaths had not been present. He had been in the wilds outside Los Angeles planning the next acts in a drama begun many years ago and a thousand miles away. In the ensuing days, the killings would seem a portent worthy of a desert prophet. The rich would cower in their mansions, while the poor went on with their lives unworried. 
Former peace activists would empty the racks of local gun stores. Rival police teams would overlook clues to advance comfortable theories. It was as if the country were looking into a funhouse mirror reflection of biblical prophecy. Lions would not lie down with lambs, but be slaughtered by them. Only 19 days earlier, Americans had reveled in humankind's great achievement in setting foot on the moon. Now they were forced to look into the darkest recesses of our animal nature. Days later, the love generation would dance in the mud of Woodstock while authorities attempted to come to grips with the Cielo Drive murders. Untroubled by the police, the killers would retreat to their Death Valley abode, awaiting the Armageddon they hoped to initiate. Their Messiah would lead them in search of the bottomless pit, where, he had told them, they would hide out for a hundred years before re-emerging to rule the world. After all, the Beatles had predicted it. August 1st, 1939. A gray convertible Packard drives along a dark country road just outside Charleston, West Virginia. Behind the wheel is Frank Martin, who for at least part of the evening considered himself a lucky man. In the passenger seat beside him is Kathleen Maddox, a young woman he met only an hour ago at the Blue Moon Beer Parlor. She might not be destined for Hollywood, but she's outgoing and friendly, and seems like the kind of girl willing to let the night take them where it may. Frank had flashed a wad of bills, and she was all eyes, talking big about getting a hotel room for the night. But they were barely in his car when she changed her mind, and the hotel room turned into a trip to a nearby dance hall. Things didn't look much better when she asked him to pick up her brother Luther en route. But Frank was easy going about it. Who knew how the evening might turn out? They're barely out of town, barreling down an unlit road when Luther, sitting in the back, says to pull over. Frank's not doing any such thing. If this guy needs to use the can, he can damn well wait till they get to the dance hall. Next thing Frank knows, something hard is pressed between his shoulder blades, and affable Luther turns dead serious. I mean it, he growls, pressing his point with another poke in Frank's back. Damn, thinks Frank as he pulls the Packard off the road. This evening has definitely taken a turn for the worse. Kathleen watches as the two men get out of the car. It's then that Frank notices the ketchup bottle in Luther's hand. If that doesn't take the prize, being stuck up by a ketchup bottle. Frank has had about enough of these two. He turns back to the car when, crack, this joker pastes him one alongside the head with the bottle, knocking him to the ground. Frank is seeing stars and coughing road dust, feeling hands reaching for his wallet. When he can see straight again, what he sees is the two of them, brother and sister, driving off into the night in his gray Packard coupe. To make it worse, he's pretty sure he can hear them laughing. LAPD officer Jerry Joe DeRosa was first to arrive at the ASIN residence, next door to 10,050 Cielo Drive in the Hollywood Hills. Homeowner Ray ASIN had called the police after opening his door to a hysterical Winifred Chapman. The housekeeper had been shouting incoherently about blood and bodies everywhere. DeRosa couldn't get much more than that out of her. He learned from Mr. Asen that the neighboring property had been rented to film director Roman Polanski and his wife, an actress named Sharon Tate. Two friends, Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frykowski, had been staying there while the couple was in Europe, though Mrs. Polanski had recently returned. Mrs. Chapman managed to get out the name of hairstylist Jay Sebring, whose black Porsche she'd seen parked near the garage. DeRosa returned to his squad car for his rifle, then approached the Polanski home with Mrs. Chapman. She remained outside the gate as the officer stepped onto the grounds. Immediately, he saw the body of a young man slumped sideways across the front seat of the Rambler, his clothes drenched in blood. There was no need to check for a pulse. Moments later, LAPD officer William Weisenhunt arrived, grabbing his shotgun. He joined DeRosa in the driveway as a third LAPD patrol car pulled up, and Officer Robert Burbridge got out. The three officers approached the main house. 
About 20 feet from the front door, a man lay on his side in the grass, colorfully attired in bell bottoms and purple shirt. He appeared to have dozens of stab wounds. His face was battered beyond recognition. About 25 feet away, a young woman lay on her back, her arms splayed outwards. She was barefoot, dressed in what had been a white nightgown, now red from the multiple stab wounds to her torso. DeRosa remained on the lawn watching the front door for possible perpetrators, while Wisenhunt and Burbridge went around the side of the house. Wisenhunt noticed a window screen had been slit along the bottom, perhaps by the assailants. Farther on, they found an open window and looked inside. The two officers climbed inside the house. This has been a special preview of Young Charlie, out now. To listen to the rest of this episode, subscribe to Young Charlie on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this right now. Or if you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe the cover art to find a link that will take you there.